Did you cook tonight? <laughs> okay. Namaste. Hi. Namaste. Namaste, my dears. How are you? <laughs> Fine. Fine. Thank, Thank you. you so uh, buenos días. Buenos días a todos. Um, bueno, acabamos de empezar este Facebook Live. Uh, teacher, I will say some, some things in Spanish, but we will keep the, we will keep the interview uh, in English uh, entirely, so it will be more fluent. So, because uh, in general, Spanish speakers can understand English, but we are very scared of speaking, but uh, most of people can understand. <laughs> So, sin problema, will, sin problema. <laughs> so I will just say uh, the introduction in Spanish and a lot of another little things in Spanish and of course the question is if they are in Spanish I will read it in Spanish but the conversation will not be translated. So, uh, vale, vale. Let's see how is it going. Uh, Ok, so thank you so much. Buenos días para todos. Eh, muchas gracias por unirse a esta conversación. Eh, estamos aquí nuevamente muy honrados y felices de estar con eh, nuestro profesor eh, Kaustu Badesi Cachar. Eh, por favor, déjenos saber si se escucha bien, si nos están viendo bien. Eh, déjenos un saludito en el, en, el, en el chat para saber con quién, con quién estamos eh, conectados. Um, y déjenos saber si todo va bien. Um, también nos pueden escribir sus preguntas, sus comentarios y se los transmitiremos al profesor en inglés. Pero pues la conversación la vamos a mantener el día de hoy en inglés. ¿sí? Entonces, um, sé que la mayoría de nosotros puede entender bastante bien el, el idioma inglés, pero pues no, en esta ocasión no lo vamos a traducir para mantener, digamos, la conversación un poco más fluida, ¿sí? Les recordamos el tema, el tema de hoy, vamos a hablar sobre la tradición védica como fuente de inspiración y especialmente cómo la tradición védica es fuente de inspiración en el mundo del cine, en el cine, ¿sí? Es un tema bastante interesante y nosotros somos amantes del cine y asumimos que el profesor Kaustuba también es eh, amante del cine. Eh, I assume you like cinema too, teacher. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I like cinema very much. <laughs> so the, I was just saying that the, uh, the reminder of our topic is how Vedic Uh, tradition is a source of inspiration, especially in cinema. So, I think we... <laughs> I have never uh, been asked questions like this, but I find it very interesting. I, I think you are missing your Star Wars t shirt, <laughs> teacher. <laughs> You want me to get my Star Wars T-shirt? Okay. If, no. if you wish. <laughs> That will be fine. No. Uh -huh. Okay. Eh, bueno, hola, Paola. Eh, de pronto escuchas un poco de eco. Puede ser. Creo que, que se da mucho en esta plataforma, pero pero no sé si no, si, se, si hay alguna se escucha bien o no se escucha muy bien, si es muy molesto o algo, déjenos saber, por favor. Buenos días, Anita. Gracias por estar aquí. Muy bien. Entonces, eh, bueno, voy a hacer la introducción del el profesor Causto. El profesor Causto es quien sostiene en este momento el linaje mini yoga, siguiendo las enseñanzas de su abuelo, Tri y Krishna Mascaria, y su padre, de Cabezas y Cachar. Comenzó sus estudios de yoga a la edad de nueve años y eh, comenzó a guiar clases o a enseñar clases gracias eh, a la edad de 13 años con sus primeros estudiantes. Profesor y terapeuta de yoga, posee un en la Universidad de Madras, dirige profesorados de yoga alrededor del mundo es, y es autor de varios libros que promueven el bienestar físico, emocional y espiritual. Entonces, bienvenidos nuevamente a todos. Eh, muchas gracias, Paola, muchas gracias. Y bueno, 
Uh, um, I would like to, teacher, um, if you can uh, give the opening of this session with a small, with a chant, as you wish. <laughs> sure, it would be wonderful to chant. Yes. Thank you so much. Om Bhadran Karani Bheshno Nuyama Deva Bhadran Pashe Maksha Bhirya Jatra Vyashema Deva Hitayadayo Swastina Indro Bradhashravaha Swastina Pusha Vishwavidaha Swastina Starksho Arishtani Mihi Swastino Abra has Patera the Dhato. Oh, Namaste, dear friends. Namaste. Namaste, teacher. Namaste, teacher. Namaste uh, a todos. Muchas gracias. Rose. Okay, uh, teacher. So <laughs> this is very unique conversation, I think, uh, as both of us, as you, as, as as well many people around the world. Uh, most of us love cinema in one way or, or another. Uh, I will so in this conversation we're going to give like this direction about how Vedic tradition has been a source of inspiration for cinema. Um, for some movies like The Matrix, for example, uh, Doctor Strange, Star Wars, of course, <laughs> and and other movies that maybe I don't know you can think of or the our viewers can think of that have a profound message. So um, how we, we will try to find how is it connected this Vedic tradition in these movies in, or in other movies? Yeah, especially because the philosophy of uh, or different philosophies of India are very well constructed in terms of understanding everything as, as, a, as a holistic way. And, and that drives us to the first question, uh, how Vedic tradition gave an interpretation of the origin of universe? Probably in the movie Doctor Strange, we see a different multiverse, as he is called nowadays, this concept or matrix when they speak about the architect, somebody who built the matrix. So how Vedic tradition in, in terms of philosophy interpret these things of the origins of universe? <laughs> well, it's a very fantastic uh, question and I really uh, don't know how to answer it because <laughs> in the Vedic tradition, we do have this uh, concept of multiverse, which is called the Lokas. Bhuloka, Bhur Loka, Suvar Loka, Mahar Loka, Janar Loka, Tapar Loka, etc. These are seven worlds on the top, where Earth is the base. Seven worlds from the, including the Earth, is going on the top towards heaven. And there is seven worlds below that is going towards what is called Patala, that is the hell. 
And so there are totally considered to be like 14, 14 universes at least, you can call it, uh, which is at least named, but then there are of course many others. And the belief is that in each of these lokas, in each of these worlds, there exists different people. And normally it's considered that when we look at these universes that are above us, the more above we go, the better you, people are living. And the more below we go, the worse people are living, the bad, the villains are living. You know, that's, um, that's how you could say. Um, but when you talk about the origin of this, there is two dif a few different versions. For example, in the traditional Vedas, when you look at the oldest texts, oldest uh, teachings, it is always, always that the divine created these universes. And uh, there, is a, there is story that the divine created all these worlds and basically because the divine wanted to have the diverse manifestation of the world, which basically means if you see the Star Wars, the uh, I think it's the last Jedi, you will see that there is the world, there is the darkness above and the, sorry, the light above and the darkness below in the Jedi mountain. And it's the same principle that is borrowed from the Vedas that, you know, that there is this world that has been created. Now, again, it's very fascinating because that is the old, old Vedas. However, we have later a certain set of texts that are called as the Puranas that are mythological stories that actually talk about, I mean, how the world was created, but how the light lost and then how the to darkness and then how the darkness was defeated to restore a light once again. And that's where the different incarnations of the different gods are coming. So you have the uh, different incarnations of the different deities which are coming. And if you put all these incarnations along one line, of course, you will get what you get in the cinema, the entire uh, Avengers team. You know, <laughs> you will get the Avengers team. Basically, you will have all these array of uh, stars uh, from the Vedic galaxy where you will have, you know, Kurma, you will have Matsya, you will have Narasimha, you will have Vamana, you will have Krishna, you will have Rama, uh, you will have Ganesha, you will have Subramanya, you have all of these stars, you have Durga, you have Lakshmi, you have male and female gods and goddesses who have fought uh, different demons to restore the light once again. So. All these are existing long time ago. And uh, it's actually wonderful to see that uh, modern people are now trying to relate it through cinema. Because it, in a way I find it very fascinating because you know, where one of the things that influences most of us is media. And media includes not only news media, but also artistic media. And this is where cinema comes in, uh, cinema. And before cinema was books and before books were oral tradition and Puranas are books. They were recited orally, but eventually they formed the books. Then from that came the novels, like you have the Harry Potter, you have uh, uh, all these books that, that came about and then books now converted into a multimedia universe that is the cinema. And uh, very few people now read books. I'm one of the old people in this world who still reads books, but there are many, many people who don't even know what is a book. Yeah. <laughs> they, they don't know how a book looks because everything they are reading on the telephone and the iPad and things like this. Many young people they don't know. Uh, they don't know uh, that sometimes ago there were fat books with lots of information. That's great, teacher. I I love the idea of that the deities in the Vedic tradition are kind of Avengers too. <laughs> Yeah. Remember, they were the original Avengers. The Avengers the borrowed the idea of that. <laughs> That's great. Many, many, many Puranas, we have this idea 
that some of the demons are so powerful that one god is not enough so the different gods come together wow to fight together there are many many puranas that say this that when uh, the demons are sometimes so strong that one god was not enough to fight them so they all they all join together and that is our first avengers team or if some of you are justice league fans it is the justice league uh, if you want to call it you know one way or the other oh. i like the justice league name better but the avengers characters are much more uh, alive and uh, more exciting Oh, yeah. amazing. I, did, I never saw from that point of view. So this is something new for me, actually. <laughs> and for all of us, I think we are not going it's to see old. Avengers movies the same way. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I, would like, I would like to ask you, teacher, if you can give us a little, a little example, a, a, a short story about one of the old Avengers, <laughs> if you remember some. The of, the, oh. of, the, of the of the your culture of your Vedic tradition, a short one. Oh, there is there is definitely, uh, uh, for example, um, there is the story of the Mahishasura, who is actually uh, the demon who ruled over the city of Mysore. Now, Mysore today's Mysore is called Mysore because of Mahishasura, which is a great, great, great demon, very, very powerful demon. And uh, nobody could defeat him because he had done a lot of penance and tapas and he had got some very special uh, powers that could not really allow anybody to, to defeat him. Mm -hmm. So all the and, uh, the, and he had this unique situation where he had asked the blessing of the divine that he would never be defeated by a man. So the gods had to create a woman and so they created what is called Shakti and what they did when they created this Shakti is all the gods came together. Brahma gives his power of the Kamandalu or the water weapon. Shiva gives her the trident. Vishnu gives her the disc. Indra gives her the thunderbolt. Varuna gives her his power etc. And this woman acquires all of these powers into her, uh, what do you call, uh, her system. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the Avengers Endgame, you see the gauntlet mm -hmm. where the, the Iron Man is taking Time Stone, Mind Stone, Soul Stone, this Stone, oh, yes. all the powers is absorbing in order to defeat that very powerful weapon or enemy called Thanos. Now, this is what the goddess does, Mahisha Asura Mardini. She's Durga. She's actually called Mahisha Asura Mardini because Mardini means the one who killed, the goddess who killed. And Mahisha Asura is the name of the demon. So Mahisha Asura Mardini means the goddess who killed the demon called Mahisha Asura. Mm -hmm. So Durga takes that form and she absorbs all the weapons of the gods in order to destroy this uh, guy because no individual could destroy that guy, Mahishasura. He was so strong. So that's one example of the story where the combined powers of the Avengers of Vedic times come together and actually um, destroy the enemy it's very fascinating isn't it wow it's amazing story <laughs> i i would love to see this, this i will see it again the yeah. movie so it will be another view yeah. <laughs> and, and probably and the bollywood uh, industry also has created some of the fascinating recreated no, no. fascinating histories no Maybe. bollywood no uh, tamilwood tamilwood Tamil. Tamil. Hollywood, Hollywood, Hollywood. It's called K O L L Y Wood, Hollywood. We do have some. I mean, we do have some old movies from maybe the seventies <coughs> and eighties that talk about these gods and goddesses. But modern movies from Bollywood or Hollywood are not really interested in the gods. They are not so interested. Oh, we miss that. <laughs> oh, well, you tell them. <laughs> I would be amazing to see 
those uh, um, recreations. recreations in, you know, with the special effects and all that. <laughs> yeah, and if you see, if you see the movie called um, the the Black Panther, there is okay. uh, uh, there is a character called Mbaku, who is basically uh, uh, kind of inspired by Hanuman. And if you look at the movie Black Panther very carefully, you will see that at the entrance of the cave, there is a statue of Hanuman. And even in one of the dialogues, he says, Mbaku says in the Black Panther movie, victory to Hanuman. Hanuman is our Indian god yeah. who helped Rama, the monkey god. Yeah. So wow. in Black Panther also, you have inspiration from Vedic times with Hanuman and, uh, in this movie. Yeah. Wow. Wow, that's great. Interesting. So I I think one of your favorite is also Doctor Strange, and I remember very well the one of the first scenes with the this uh, priestess is like touching the forehead of the guy, and he starts this journey. Do you remember, teacher, that the scene that and he and she uh, speaks about the multiverses, and the Correct. some of the universes are uh, benevolent and others are uh, malevolent, <laughs> you know? And so it's like this accurate to the Vedic also? <coughs> of course, they have taken some kind of artistic license as well, but the concept is the same. The concept is the same. Now, just think about it. We live in a multiverse in, in any case. Like, for example, if you look at the universe, it's basically a question of space and time. Now, so we are occupying this room and this time I'm here with you in my office room in the house for one hour and I am occupying this space. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, there is microscopic space within this room inside which there is a recreation of this. Maybe I don't exist, but maybe some bacteria or some small germs are existing within a smaller space. So it's just a replication of the space and time in a multiple dimension, some at a macro level, some at a micro level. And you look, when you look, think about it, if you expand and if you contract, you will eventually see the same thing. And there have been a lot of scientific uh, uh, experiments now with photography where they have seen uh, how to photograph the universe at so many different kilometers and so many different kilometers. And then they take a cell and then they go into it into similar multiply, into similar multiples. They find that the design is ultimately the same at the macro and the micro level, how the universe is manifesting. So we are existing in a multiverse, whether we, we see it or not, whether we recognize it or not. And the symbolic thing about that movie, Doctor Strange, where they are very accurate, is that the lady touches him, not in the forehead, but actually she's touching him in the Agnya Chakra region, which is the eye, the, the eye to the door, the door that opens to the spiritual domain, because you have to see this multiverse metaphorically. So you have to open an eye that is not the usual eyes, but actually you have to open the Agnya Chakra, which is considered the gateway to the spiritual domains. And when you see that, then you see the whole universe, both at a micro and at a macro level. And this is what Krishna is also trying to teach Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita when he gives him what is called the Vishwarupa, where he gives them the big form where Arjuna is able to see both the macro and the micro elements at the same moment. It's very fascinating. So that is exactly what is happening there in the um, Doctor Strange. But as I said, they are uh, taking certain artistic liberties, for example, because when she's doing that and she's, they are creating this yantra, the yantra they're creating is the Shri Yantra, and the Shri Yantra is not really the Yantra of the Agnya Chakra. Uh, so there are some artistic license, but I can understand that they took that because 
It is a very, very beautiful yantra. Uh, visually, it's a very attractive, but also at a three-dimensional level, it exists. And it's, it's explaining the Sri Yantra, we are very often used to seeing it in 2D, but actually it's in 3D and it's, there is a South India, there is a temple where they have put the Sri Yantra in 3D and it's just remarkable how it is. And it's actually talking about the concept that I told you about the multiple dimensions of both the worlds above and the worlds below in infinite manner. And Sri is the goddess feminine, the goddess of creation, and therefore it's it's presented in that way because without the mother you can't really create so the creator is usually a feminine energy i believe i know some people may not like it that it's the feminine energy but i believe that it's a feminine energy and that's why there is this chakra that is used which they are which is called as the shri chakra and so they use that with a little bit of artistic license to actually create that which i think is okay it's very beautiful to look at Yes, yes, I think it's a good, uh, as you say, a good effort and, and a good intention, you know, because it's, it's good to, to, you know, to have the approach to these uh, very profound subjects in uh, artistic license, as you say, <laughs> make, it, yeah. make it more easy. <laughs> and it it's very easy. interesting. Yeah, but it's also what I feel is that they are so beautiful because these concepts people don't understand, but there are certain magical things behind it. And uh, it's very interesting because uh, some days ago, one of my students uh, from Germany had asked me for some help with a certain problem. And I sent her a chant and she doesn't know Sanskrit, but she's got a lot of faith in me. And I'm so grateful for that. She listens to it. and. She wrote to me back today. She said, I'm feeling much better and my skin is much more better because she had some skin issues. And the very important thing she wrote, I don't understand the magic of the chant, but it works. Yeah. And it's the same thing with many of these yantras because the yantra is actually a creation with mantras included. There is, and that's the other artistic license because they just take the form. But they, what they forget is within that form is inscribed certain mantras and that's the magic. Mm -hmm. If you just draw that as a geometric diagram, that's not the magic. The magic is the mantras associated with that. Every yantra has a mantra and Sri Yantra also has mantras secretly embedded, which they don't show in the movie, probably because they would have removed it for many reasons. One, maybe they didn't know what it was, Two, maybe they would have removed it because they may not have wanted to have some kind of religious associations or things like that. I don't know. But this is the magic behind these yantras. Okay, teacher, thank you. Thank you so much. This is amazing. Yeah, uh, this... Okay, bueno, vamos a saludar. Gracias, Felitza, por estar aquí. María del Mar, eh, Rofus, Lenka, um, Ana, Paola. Mm, si alguien más se ha unido últimamente, por favor, nos dejan un mensaje. Por supuesto, sentimos mucho no estar haciendo la traducción eh, simultánea, pero bueno, eh, creo que estamos eh, siendo muy claros en, en, tratando de ser muy claros en el inglés que estamos conversando. Y trataremos de que al subir el video, si lo podemos subir más adelante, los subtítulos lo, lo subiremos con los subtítulos en español si tenemos la, la opción de hacerlo una vez termine esta entrevista. Entonces, por favor, también nos pueden dejar sus comentarios y sus preguntas. Estamos hablando acerca de cómo la tradición médica ha influenciado la industria del cine en las que podríamos llamar que ya tienen un, un enfoque más hacia lo espiritual, hacia lo... Eh, hacia lo más allá de lo que podemos ver, eh, películas a las que hemos hecho referencia como Star Wars, Doctor Strange, The Matrix, eh, entonces ese es el tema que estamos tocando hoy, pues para quienes recién se unen tengan un poquito más de idea. Eh, so, eh, going to the next question. Yes, teacher, and when you talk about the temple in, 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 your, in, in the south of India, I guess, uh, with this three dimension, 
It, I, it drives me to the next question, and it's about if there is some view of interplanetary existence, as you say, we occupy a space and time. Maybe at the same moment here, we are here on this planet, but probably there is an, another interplanetary existence. How it is uh, understand you know, from, Vedic. from Vedic tradition or from Vedic views? Of course, there is a explanation of the interplanetary existences and uh, there is so many fascinating concepts and this is where they are dividing the concept of uh, time and space. So, for example, when we go back in time to the first era, what is called the Satya Yuga or the Krita Yuga, the first era of time, they said that the good and the bad were in two different planets. So good people were in one planet, bad people were in another planet. So that's where you have all these old, old uh, stories about, for example, Shiva be destroying what is called Tripura. That's why Shiva is called Tripura Antaka. There are three bad brothers who are having three different cities built. One built of gold, one built of silver, one built of bronze, and they are constantly rotating. And basically, this is nothing but different planets. Okay? okay? Now, if you look at certain planets, they look golden in color. Probably it's Venus. Probably the uh, silver is uh, Mercury planet, you know, things like that. So they're constantly rotating and the, the story is that the bad demons are living in these uh, three planets and they are torturing people. They are creating a lot of bad things in people. So the only time to destroy them all at once is when the planets are aligning at you know, one singularity and Shiva shoots an arrow through which pierces all the three planets and it destroys. It's kind of like if you watch the second movie of Thor, I think it is um, Thor, not Ragnarok, but the one before that, Dark uh, Thor, Dark World. They talk about the alignment of the planets and to kind of create the destruction at that point of time. So, Tripuram Taka, Shiva is called. So, the concept that there were interplanetary existences existed, and this was in the old, old era. When time changed to what is called the Treta Yuga, the time of Rama, they said that, well, the good and the bad are living in different countries. We have Rama in India, Ravana in Sri Lanka, it's different countries. In the Dwapara Yuga, the third era, the time of the Mahabharata, the bad and the good are living within the same family. Kauravas and the Pandavas, they are the same family, they are cousins, but they are evil. We are so lucky that we are in the Kali Yuga, the good and the bad live within the same person. We are so terrible that we are in the chasm that there are some part, moments, that's why we have so much internal conflict. So good and the bad exist within ourselves. So definitely the Vedic teachings are talking a lot about interplanetary existences. Now I told you just one story of the Shiva, the Tripurantaka, who is in another planet, but there are so many different stories in the Vedic Puranas where the gods are traveling to another planet to have their fight. So they had their space machines. They had their space machines that would take them from one place to the other. You know, like Vishnu has Garuda. Garuda is probably the first millennial falcon. You know, it's called millennial falcon in the Star Wars. Oh. Okay, falcon is a bird which is very close to Garuda which is the bird, the, the vehicle of Vishnu. And Vishnu has gone on Garuda to many different planets 
to kind of have wars with the, the bad people. So maybe Star Wars took this Millennial Falcon, and if you look at the, 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 the air, aircraft, it is kind of shaped like a bird with large wings. Yeah. And this yeah. is maybe inspiration from Garuda, who also has huge wings. Wow, uh, that's amazing, definitely. This, this uh, answer, teacher, drives me to the, the, the macrocosmos lives within us in a microcosmos so we are kind of totally connected with the, the micro view to the micro view nowadays so yeah. that that means that we are so uh let's say so separate because mentally we don't understand but but we are totally connected with the universe uh, of course of course we are influenced by many things in the universe because we are each of us we are born under different space different time there is the astrology and astrology is not unique to vedic culture the romans and the ancient europeans also had it the mayans had it in latin america the original native people in north america also had it they looked at the stars, the Australian Aboriginal people have it. They look at the stars, they look at the alignments and they say, okay, you are influenced more by Jupiter. You will have this kind of personality, this kind of predetermined uh, factors because Jupiter is dominant for you. For somebody else, Saturn may be dominant. For somebody else, uh, Mercury may be dominant. And we, and these things have, depending on the planetary movement, some moments they have strong influences, some moments they have big influences, and this is what is happening in our life. Nature responds to that. You see the ocean waves change according to which planet, which position of the moon is dominant. The seasons are affected by that. And we are not separate from nature. We want to be separate from nature. It's very funny for me because when people tell me, oh, I want to go and walk in nature. Well, we are nature. Yes. We just separated ourselves so much from it. That's the problem. We are nature. We separated ourselves so much from it. That's the problem. That, yes, that is like we don't recognize it, that we are nature. Um, that we are nature. Yeah, what is nature? We say, oh, plants, animals, birds insects water mountain earth and what about us we are supposed to be part of nature as well because we are made up of all this we get influenced by all this we influence all this absolutely yes and i think it's very important to start uh, to understand the astrology a little bit more and for example for us as women we are strongly influenced by the moon um, because of the cycles. And that's why it's called the moon cycle. Exactly. <laughs> yes, and but, we... uh, sometimes we don't know why, why we are feeling in some way or why we are feeling in some other way. And we don't understand it. <laughs> so I think astrology and understanding the moon and all that is very important to understand. But just because... But just because we don't understand it, it does not mean that it is not a reality. Absolutely. Yes. I'll give you a simple example. I used to travel in the air, airplane when I was traveling before the corona many times. And uh, I would just sit and, and enjoy the travel. But I don't understand how a plane can travel because I have not studied aerospace engineering I'm not an engineer by qualification. I studied economics. I didn't study engineering. I don't understand engineering. So, but I'm sitting on a machine that is functioning on principles of engineering. But just because I don't understand, it does not mean that it is not a reality. Exactly. The same way, just because somebody does not understand astrology or astronomy, or spirituality for that matter. It does not mean that it is not a reality. Just because we don't understand something, it doesn't mean that it is not a reality. 
Yeah, there are still many people, well, it's my personal view, that they don't believe in, uh, in life outside this earth. So many people still think, and I, I don't know if it's okay or not, uh, that we are the only ones in the universe, no? The planet Earth and the earthlings. <laughs> well, if we think that, then we are so arrogant, and that is part of the problem. Human beings are quite arrogant. Yes, yes, definitely. So I think it's interesting. So thank you. Thank you for this uh, insight, teacher. Uh, well, so um, the other question that uh, we have, and uh, thank you, Ruben. Gracias, Ruben, por estar aquí. <laughs> um, the concept of energy as a source of spiritual light, uh, how is interpreted in the Vedic tradition? And we go back, uh, for example, to a Star Wars movie when they talk about the force. I think it refers to that. The force be with you. Like they may the say. force be with you. And <laughs> yes, this is very much explained in many ancient teachings, the Upanishad teachings, for example, uh, Maharishi Yogi Yajna Valkya, he talks about this both in the Yajna Valkya Samhita and also in the Shukla Yajurveda, that the prana must be contained within the body for us to fulfill our dharma and also maintain health. Because the prana is what gives us the energy to do things. We cannot do anything without prana. We cannot do anything without prana. So the idea that maintain prana within your system. So it means that, for example, if I have to wear this glass always with me because that is what helps me to see. Now, sometimes when I'm leaving my house, uh, my mother will say, oh, you know, keep your glasses on so you can see carefully. Mm -hmm. So it's almost, if you translate it into Star Wars movie term, it's almost like, may the glasses be with you, <laughs> right? So you replace the word glass with prana. It's mm -hmm. as simple as that, because only when we have prana, we can do anything. And if we want to fight darkness, we need to find uh, prana to defeat the darkness, because prana is the source of light. Light and prana are synonymous. It's kind of like one cannot exist without the other. Yes. In, in the Vedic uh, mythology, we talk about prana uh, and light as kind of like sun and the sunlight. There's no sunlight without the sun. Yeah. So right. you can't separate light and prana. The same way you cannot separate sun and sunlight. Mm -hmm. So, so that that means that the sun is is the ones to provide us that that spiritual energy for yes, us. Yes, and, and that is the God, the Ishwara, the divine. Mm -hmm. Ishwara is the source of prana, and that you will see in another movie called Avatar. Oh, okay. Avatar. Where yeah. they say we, we only borrow energy. We don't have yeah. energy, we borrow. And this is very Vedic principle because when we are doing any kind of ritual, when we are doing any mantra practice, when we have to use energy to help somebody, to heal somebody, we are making a sankalpa, which means a commitment, where one of the terms we are using is Sri Bhagavad Agnya, with the permission from God. We are going to use this energy for this and this purpose. Because energy does not belong to us. Energy belongs to the divine. Now, if I want to borrow a car from you, I have to ask your permission first. I can't just take it and go. <laughs> Same way, if we have to use prana, which belongs to God, we have to ask God permission. Sri Bhagavad Anyaya. We are asking permission from the divine. To use this mantra, to use this prana, whatever, whichever has got the source of prana for this purpose. So we have to tell God also what is the purpose we are doing. We can't just take it because we want to take it. That's the problem with all the conquerors. They just want to take it. Whereas 
the traditional systems like the shamanic system, for example, or the Vedic system, or the pagan system, what you call Pagano, is basically honoring, you take anything you take from the nature, anything you take from this universe, you have to state the purpose because you can't take it just because you want it. That's greediness. That's not allowed. And that is something that is absolutely dominant in this era, the greediness. We yeah. take everything, the resources from the earth and from other people and all for ambition. And that's, I think that's why we are the way we are now. <laughs> that is why we are suffering. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. But, but how you, you, you can understand when the prana, when the prana is not the, the good prana, how you take this uh, opposite side? Senor, there is no good prana or bad prana. There is only prana. But okay. it can be used for good purpose or bad purpose. Okay. I see. I see. Okay, I, I give you a simple example. I give you a simple example. We talked about the sunlight. Now, the sunlight will not make any discrimination. It will nourish the mango plant. At the same time, it will also nourish the poisonous plant. Mm -hmm. It will nourish the lion. It will also nourish the deer. Mm -hmm. It will not make discrimination. But what that energy is used for determines whether it is good or bad person or being or whatever. If you read Ramayana, Mahabharata and all, you will see that the enemies are also strong. They have prana. The prana is very strong in them. Mm -hmm. But what they are using it for is bad purpose. It's not that their prana is bad. They are using I... that prana for bad purpose. Because if prana was bad, it's easy for us. Because good prana, strong prana will always destroy the bad prana. But that's not the problem. I... I just remember the Kung Fu Panda tree, the tree, I don't yeah. know, when the, this guy who, yes, he was using the yeah. chi, taking the chi of others. The chi is like the same as the prana. He was taking the chi of others and he was, at, the, at, that, at that point, it was too much for him and it destroyed him because he exactly. was using it for bad purposes. That's why you cannot take everything you can't take everything his name was kai 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 yes mm -hmm. i remember kai is the, the 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 ox the kind of uh, uh, ox bull toro yes, the bull. Bull, yes. who takes all the prana from all the great masters but he cannot handle and that's what is happening in our world now we are consuming 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 we cannot manage. At one point, we will explode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I just remember that one. So, oh, teachers, you are amazing with the movies. Yes. I am impressed. Do you remember the no, name? No, 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 no. <laughs> just, just, just a few days ago on the TV here, we had the Kung Fu Panda playing. So it's a recent movie I just remembered. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good one. I enjoy it a lot. I like it. Come on. And you see there also, the group is coming and they are giving the prana with okay. love in the heart. Now, love is connected to the divine. You cannot love if you are not connected to the divine. It's impossible. Now, you may not believe or in the divine, that's your choice. But if you are in love, you are connected to the divine because that is what is expansive energy and you cannot have that expansive energy without love and you cannot have love without the connection to the divine so it's kind of like hand in hand yes 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 yeah. giving back the energy to who yeah giving back our energy is very simple for me it's our sure. doing our dharma it's doing our dharma that's it we are given this body and this uh -huh. uh, uh, mind and these senses to do a dharma we want, we have given this to do our dharma. So the best way to give back this dharma 
is by doing the dharma so we use the energy that we are borrowing to fulfill our dharma and that's the best way each of us we have different dharma we cannot do the same thing so maybe uh, one person will give back by doing some community work one person will do it by teaching that is my dharma somebody else may do it actually for in a artistic way somebody may be doing some social service we are meant to do our dharma we are not meant to do a job yeah. it's a very different thing we know we should not do it just for earning some money because money is a very recent concept and it only exists in the human world you know dogs cats animals plants they are all exchanging prana but without money <laughs> money has made it a little bit toxic this exchange but unfortunately that's the world we are living in so we need to worship we need to worship that money in a respectful manner and not in a manner that is disrespectful so it's a very important thing that we have to remember that money is important in today's society but the relationship should be very healthy otherwise we will get really trapped yeah because it's also temporary thing of, of course is yeah of course in the material and money, world and money is not a natural uh, mode of exchange it's a man made uh, it's a created something by man that's it <laughs> Well, I, I guess we are approaching to our last question. Unfortunately, uh, the time has gone so fast, and uh, seems like we are like uh, actors, uh, probably finding finding our best role on this planet. And um, as you say, teacher, humans we are so gifted, but seems like we ignore the essence of the inner life. Uh, what the Vedic tradition in yoga suggests about it, about this inner life. For example, we remember, I do remember the, the movie Matrix and when, when Neo, the main character, is asked about to take a pill, a pill which is blue and red, and, 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 and he needs to pick one to take, a, to take him to the reality. What do you believe about this um, essence of the inner life? to take us to the reality. I, I, I don't know if we need a pill for that. <laughs> we wish. <laughs> I, I don't think we can do it with a pill. But more metaphorically, I think the two pills for me is essentially the pill of divinity and the pill of materialism. Mm -hmm. okay. And it depends on which one we want to consume more. If we are consuming, if we are more connected to the divine, in whatever form, it doesn't have to be only through one religion or the other. It could also be in a, in a non-religious manner, like connecting with nature, connecting with sun, how the ancients were doing. If we connect with through that medium, we are, we are going to see the reality very differently from if we are going to be connected to the pill of materialism. Unfortunately, in today's society, more people want to choose the materialistic pill, and that creates the problem. Now, matter is not bad, but we must live in such a way that it is not our boss. We have to remember that matter is there to serve us. We are not there to serve matter. We are there to serve something higher, something divine. Because if you look at it, we always should serve somebody who is higher than us, not somebody who is lower. Yes. Matter is lower than us. The divine is higher than us. Mm -hmm. So we need to serve that divine and we need to remind ourselves that we are the master of matter because in the hierarchy, matter is below us. But most, exactly. people, most people now admire the one who has more money or more power or more material things and the people yes, admire I, that i know that because it is the lies that have been told in society and the lies we have created in society to live like that see my grandfather lived 101 years in his lifetime 
I'll tell you some fact about my grandfather, two facts about my grandfather, which is impossible to think about in modern times. My grandfather, in 101 years of his life, he never owned a house. Think about it. Okay. Second problem, second point, which is even more fascinating. In 101 years of his life, he never had a bank account. Wow. <laughs> now, can you can you think about somebody like that living today? It's very difficult. Absolutely. <laughs> it's very difficult. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, it's like that. So we have to like un and think about it. Find the balance. Like Think about it. My grandfather died in 1989. It's not so long ago. No. no. It's only about 40 years. 30, yes. 30, 30 plus, plus years. 30 plus. Yeah, 30 plus years. That's it. Wow. wow, that's amazing. So, yeah, we wish we can solve the problems with taking the pill, well, <laughs> the matrix pill. But but this 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 lie. Uh, last example about your grandfather, uh, T. Krishnamacharya. And do you believe that yoga for him was the main uh, source of inner light? To, to yoga control? was the two, I, if you ask my grandfather, he would never say that yoga is the source of inner light. The divine is always the source of inner light. Okay. Yoga was the tool that helped him stay connected with the inner light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Excellent, excellent. Okay, teacher, so the time for us is up. Uh, so I would like to recommend to all of you and to you, teacher, to one last movie I recommend from Disney is the Soul movie. Is, I don't know if you are very into, I know you like animated movies, and now I know it. <laughs> but this is amazing about the concept of Purusha. I think it's, it's, it's very fascinating. Um, I don't know, maybe if you know I, Cecilia. I will watch. Yes, yes. I, I will definitely watch it. I believe our audience has been very thrilled to hear your conversation like a movie because there is no questions for you at no the moment, comments. no comments. <laughs> so they have been uh, taking some, uh, how do you call it? Uh, popcorn. Maybe, popcorn. Popcorn. <laughs> Maybe they were having popcorn and Coca-Cola and watching it. <laughs> Absolutely. And you know, we are so wide in the screen. It's like the yes. 17 mm screen. <laughs> <Absolutely>. Cinema mode. <laughs> Perfect for today. Yeah. Okay, teacher. So as usual, thank you so much for thank your you. generosity, for yeah. your time. You so uh, as usual, it has been very, very fun. Not only like enlightening, but also very fun as usual. So uh, thank you so much, and thank you. Uh, muchas gracias a todos por estar aquí. Por uh, nos disculpamos de que no tuvimos la traducción, pero trataremos de, de subir los subtítulos más adelante en el canal. Y, so, uh, I hope we can meet again soon to, to have another interesting conversation about yoga and Vedic tradition and other sure. things that we need to know. <laughs> sure, so, sure. thanks so much. Um, uh, I don't know if you would like to make a small chant to finish. Sure, we will do a small peace chant. Thank you. Om Tachayora Vruni Mahi Gatai Yajnaya Gatai Yajnapataye Daivi swasthira stunaha swasthir manushe bhyaha or dvanje gato bhesha jam shanno asto dvipade shanchatoshpade Om Shanti 
Namaste. 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 Uh, I would like to make the last announcement in Spanish. Uh, el profesor Causto va a liderar el próximo domingo en la madrugada una un, un mini yoga uh, global prayer o una oración por las mujeres y los niños de Afganistán. Entonces eh, les enviaremos la información más adelante por si desean unirse a esta eh, global prayer, a esta oración por, por la gente de Afganistán. So I just made the announcement of the global prayer for Afghanistan children and women. So I hope for us it will be in the middle of the night, but of course in America in general, but we will try to join. So I hope many of you can join us. Namaste. Thank you, teacher. Bye. Namaste. Bye -bye.